Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. The story of the extinction of the Rocky Mountain locust. Locust, the opera. Written, composed, choreographed, and performed in Wyoming. A history of Wyoming, the mountains. With music, it comes alive. Next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for Wyoming Chronicle is provided in part by the Dragicevich Foundation, supporting the work of the Jackson Hole Historical Society and Museum. I guess in a sense this opera began um, 25 years ago when I went up into the Wind Rivers of Wyoming looking for the remains of the extinct Rocky Mountain locust up in the glaciers. Um, and I found them after several expeditions and had scientific papers on that and then Maybe 15 years ago, I wrote a popular um, science book on the story of the Rocky Mountain locust, this incredible creature that once blackened the skies of the pioneers and then suddenly disappeared with the last living specimen caught in 1904. And then about four years ago, um, I was involved in a project at, the, at UCROSS Foundation where we brought together scientists and artists from the University of Wyoming to engage in um, creative enterprises together. And that's where I really became familiar with um, Annie Guzzo's music and her talents and her creativity and the potential of integrating the stories of the natural world with music. And so that planted a seed um, and that seed eventually took root in terms of our collaboration. Um, and we agreed that uh, uh, we would seek funding to tell the story of the Rocky Mountain locust through opera. The words of the opera are called a libretto, um, and writing a libretto is really a matter of, um, it's almost like poetry, right? You have to say a great deal in very few words. Singers take forever to say words, um, and so you don't get many words when you're the lyricist or the librettist. Um, and so I went from a book-length uh, story to a story of just a few hundred words. Um, and I, but I'd always been fascinated with what's now very popular, the short form, right? And the most famous short story was Ernest Hemingway's six word short story, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Um, and so that capacity of six words to create a narrative arc and tug at your heartstrings has really got me fascinated with what can be done with few words. And so, Really, it was a matter of turning this um, novel, it wasn't a novel, uh, uh, the story of the Rocky Mountain Locust, scientific history, into a few hundred words. It was a matter of distilling it. What is the essence? What, what really is the core of that story? Um, and, and in a sense, it was converting a book into um, uh, poetic lines. I am very interested in this project because, first of all, I love working with Jeff. He's, he's a very creative and communicative author. Um, we work well together in, um, in adjustments and, and additions and subtractions. So that's one thing is you've really got to have a great relationship with a librettist if you're going to bother to set words. So that's the first thing. But also, I think this idea of creating music that might further the aims of conservation, uh, a history of Wyoming, things I love, the mountains. Um, these are things that really motivate me and, and move me and resonate with me. And I really like to write music that actually has heart to it. And so that's, that's a lot of what um, attracted me to this project is those two things. Um, I've also wanted to write an opera, and I've written art songs and a children's opera, but I wanted to, to go to the next uh, subject. 
they're not rhyming poems, and it's not Italian. And so when you have those two challenges, Italian's a very singable language. English isn't so much so. So when I'm setting scientific names, when I'm setting uh, ecological and words like that, it's kind of a challenge to decide where to place those in a human voice so that you're not just stumbling and mumbling and doesn't come out sounding like Gilbert and Sullivan patter song or something. Um, those have been some of the challenges. And the fact that sometimes a natural way of speaking in some of the writing is something that doesn't have meter to it. So meter is regular pulse, something like that. Um, it's hard to put natural speech into regular meter. And I'm not using a lot of unusual meters. So that has been a bit of an interesting challenge. And I find myself really trying to figure out where the syllable falls in a word or uh, where it fits in the rhythm. I am very excited about this opera. I love doing non-traditional works, especially within the classical realm, because I feel like that's the future of classical music, is to really take unusual topics or unusual places and put them together, and this really has everything. I mean, I get to be a ghost bug. I mean, not many sopranos get to say that they get to play a bug or a ghost or both. Um, so that's very exciting for me. And it's also very exciting to bring a new work to life because I love new works. This is the first chance I've had to do a new work in a non-traditional location and also to have more of a hand in helping collaborate on the entire aspect of this production, which has been really, really nice as a singer because I like to be really involved. Well, my role of conductor is actually probably a little bit larger than Conductor uh, Annie and I have a, a pretty long working relationship in terms of realizing not only her music, but the music of some of her student composers here at the, at the university. And in doing that, I've also supplied her with musicians uh, from my Colorado Chamber Orchestra, which is a professional orchestra that I have in Colorado. So when this project, uh, when the funding came through for this, um, and he asked me whether I'd be willing to conduct it, whether I'd be willing to assemble the musicians, and, and also whether I would be able to uh, track down some singers that would be appropriate for this opera. When I first um, considered being part of an opera, um, I thought this would be a really fun and interesting endeavor, um, and I can do this. Um, Making sculpture is basically um, taking materials and creating something new, creating an illusion. And so um, to be a part of this opera um, with the set design and the costumes, um, it felt very natural to me. And, um, and I like a good problem to solve. When I conceptualized the set design for Locust the Opera, um, I, I wanted it to have a warm feel knowing there were two scenes, right? The, the prairie as well as um, the scientist's um, study. And so I was really looking at Darwin's um, study. Um, the warmness that's within it, um, it looked like a pretty amazing place for intellectual thought, um, but cozy, you could really um, snuggle in, in one of the big chairs. Um, and, uh, and so I wanted lots of props to be around um, that it feel like that study, um, but also because of the stage was the size that it was, we needed to make sure that both of the scenes could fit on the stage at the same time because there would be no time to move the props on and off the stage. So they had to work as a cohesive um, uh, piece in and of itself. And so I tried to think of it in terms of an art installation and how all the materials would work together, the colors would work together, so that if someone saw both at the same time, which they would do, it would make sense visually.
drink last night. What do you want? Answer. 
and tossed each winter. a trap, a prelude to slaughter. Indeed, there's no safety to be found in an ecological bottleneck. Amen. There is no peace to be found in a whiskey bottle.